the impulse to limit and restrict and nudge and smear and censor are something we should uh, make sure that we don't allow to happen and that we sing a much better song which is future oriented which is based on our capabilities uh, and creating a dynamic society that everyone can uh, transform the world that we live in and create many more opportunities together. Today on British Thought Leaders I sit down with Alan Miller, co-founder of Together, an association founded in response to the Covid lockdowns. Together campaigns on issues of public freedom such as 15 minute cities, digital IDs and free speech. I'm Lee Hall and this is British Thought Leaders. Alan Miller, thank you for joining us on British Thought Leaders. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Can you tell us a bit about Together Organisation, what, what you do and what you hope to achieve? Uh, together, we think that the public should be at the heart of things. That means when decisions are being made, it should be about what citizens, what local residents, what we need, not what the market say or what sort of technocrats think needs to happen. So we're... Uh, dedicated to the idea that the public should be at the heart of things. And we think that freedom is really essential. In the last few years, we've seen uh, impositions and encroachments on freedom, freedom of speech, freedom of protest. Uh, and we think that goes to the heart of living in a, a democratic and free society and it needs to be upheld. And that the best way to do that is to encourage as many people to do that together. Together events have this real kind of grassroots feel to them. People don't just sit and watch, they get involved, ask questions, kind of like a community town hall type thing. Do you think this community involvement in, in politics and local politics has been somewhat lost in society? I think it really has. I think the idea that um, the public should be involved grassroots locally, regionally, nationally... Uh, it definitely has been lost. And in the last three decades, I think the public has retreated from the stage. Uh, I think that as a generation, a series uh, of different um, political parties that have become very technocratic and used to not being held accountable, I think that it is really a, a, a real problem that so few people turn out, particularly for local elections. Uh, and that um, at Together we're committed and passionate, we're committed to uh, engaging with and working with people uh, and, and passionate about the role that local, regionally and nationally people can play in politics. And actually, things have only ever happened in history when ordinary people have been involved in, in, in steering the direction of things. So Together was um, founded in response to the lockdowns. Do you feel the lockdowns were kind of like a turning point for our society? Yeah, the lockdowns, uh, everyone kept using the term unprecedented, but the lockdowns were very serious, uh, damaging, destructive impositions that certainly um, has created a situation where it's part of an idea that there might, that might be part of some repertoire. On the one hand, in terms of any responses to things, which we should always, we should utterly rule out. We've seen that the damage and the destruction and now from the lockdown files and the Twitter files and a range of things like that, how, how problematic, disruptive and wrong they were. But also the idea that you can just nudge, uh, uh, impose, restrict, obfuscate and lie. And you can uh, do these things allegedly in the name of something like the science or you know we've seen it before the, the common good it might whatever term you you might prescribe but in a cynical attempt to cajole and push things in a certain direction and i think that's the thing the th the thing about it is is that we need to be able to insist that we're not just going to have impositions and restrictions we need solutions to the issues we face there are some fantastic things but there are some real challenges we've now got a cost of living cost of lockdown crisis many issues that we face that we need to address um, and the only way that we can do that is with honesty, transparency and democratic accountability. You mentioned the cost of living there. It's obviously hitting everyone pretty hard. There's a lot of talk of oh, it's Putin's fault or it's Brexit's fault. Not much talk of what about the lockdowns and we, we close down society and close down the economy. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, some people argued from the very start that, the, that there should have been a cost-benefit analysis to anything that was going to happen. That was ruled out. It was not done. Uh, many of us also argued that lockdowns would be enormously destructive and damaging. And 
uh, this has come to to fore. It's be, it's become very apparent. Although some people don't like to talk about it much, you know, the consequences of an additional amount of huge amounts of quantity, well, you know, like quantitative easing, as we saw after the last uh, two thousand and eight economic slump and the situation there. So I think the thing is that. Um, in spite of the fact that some people don't want to address it and discuss it, the lockdowns have been enormously damaging in terms of the economy and inflation and productivity, but also in terms of over 7 million people waiting in the NHS, in terms of damage to children at schools, education, uh, in terms of uh, businesses and families and a range of areas that it's impacted. Also getting back to work uh, and people that have not got back to work, you know, uh, sickness. There's a whole range of issues that have uh, we're still dealing with uh, cascading, and they're going to have ramifications for a, a considerable time. And we really need to insist that, firstly, we don't do anything like that again, but also that we resolve these things. And and you know, there was a pandemic preparedness strategy, and it was not adhered to. It was thrown away, and we've got to make sure that doesn't happen again. Along along the lines of some of the things that are being suggested with the WHO where we challenge those ideas and we say that we need to be able... We've got what it takes. We know what to do in certain circumstances and we should never allow anything like this again. But do you think we're at the point now where we should say, that's all finished, let's put it behind us and forget it ever happened? Or are there still some things that need to kind of be dealt with? Well, you know, I, like most people, um, don't particularly enjoy reliving any of that experience. And I understand when people sort of want to just get it behind them and... Uh, in many ways, you don't want to live in the past, and that's important. But um, I think it's really, really essential that we recognise what was done, what was the problem with all of that, the the damaging impacts across the board and what it meant for our liberties, our freedoms and society and the economy and other things, and the way that fear was weaponised, um, the, the kind of P, uh, PR that was used. And it's very divisive amongst citizens and people getting very scared. Uh, and... And we should make sure that we're clear that that can't be utilised again. It isn't done again. The behavioural insights team, the nudge unit that was used, uh, psychologising fear. Uh, and also to insist that we have transparency, proper due process. You can't suspend Parliament. You have to be able to ha have these things addressed out in the open. Uh, and that we are insistent that these things can't just continue because we're told all the time it's an emergency, a crisis with all sorts of things. It th seems like it's a permanent state of crisis and emergency. So now we have a new set of criteria with a permanent with a state of crisis and we've all got to do things immediately. And we need to say, calm down, everyone. Let's have a rational approach where we engage and we assess and evaluate. We're not going to get prodded into the next big emergency and crisis. And that's not the way things are going to be. And that's really important. And we say we, we can ensure that we... we we can curate kind of solutions to anything that we face with ingenuity and innovation, but we don't get um, pressurised to constantly be feeling like we're in a permanent state of uh, emergency. Do you feel that's a, an on-purpose thing where we get pushed into the next big thing and all this fear is created? And I do think that the state uh, that we exist in at the moment, some people quite like it and some people will promote it, but it's become part of a cultural backdrop, not just a political one. That, that we're at risk at constantly. We're, we're perpetually um, vulnerable. Mm. It's become part of a debate and a discussion in policy talk for the last 20 years, this whole idea that whereas we used to see ourselves as being agents that could transform things, create change, and we were largely good with that kind of enlightened ideal that we could shape things and make things in the way that we thought would be best. Now it's become presented that we're all out of control, we're damaging, we're nasty, we're <laughs> vectors of infection, and we're killing the planet. That becomes the big discussion about humanity rather than thinking we are uh, creative, we have solutions, we can work out ways to do things. We, cre you know, we create beauty. Um, we are, for the most part, loving, decent, friendly... Uh, we get on very well with fellow citizens and in spite of ideological differences for the most part. And, you know, th this discussion that we are at an immediate crisis. I mean, if we just look back at the last few decades, some of these things have been said for quite some time. At one point in the 70s, the big discussion uh, was global cooling. 
Uh, and then we had all sorts of things. There were real concerns at acid rain and mm -hmm. there were concerns about the ozone layer. And uh, each time it seems like it was a perpetual crisis. Perpetual. We're now told as well, this is the last big warning, final warning. Uh, and I think that that is not a helpful way to look at things. I think that we need to think about how can we harness innovation? How can we transform things? How can we work for, you know, to, to get what we need to put ourselves at the heart of things? Uh, because nobody wants to just go around destroying things. But I think it's the way it's presented is part of an idea that humans are really terrible and destructive and bad. It's very misanthropic. And I think that's part of the problematic view of... And actually, it's the same view that when the leaders and the technocratic elite say, the, you know, they're all stupid or we'll just tell you what to do. And then others who critique it say, oh, this is like, you know, the COVID idiots or, you know... Mm -hmm you know, dumb people or stupid, they come out with all these terms like gammas and all that. What it really reflects, and then some people also say, you know, that you're all asleep and everything. So people from different perspectives have this view, but it really at the heart of it is this idea that humans can't be trusted. We're not able to be the uh, people that can really galvanise and transform and inspire and do things that, you know, and it's constantly this idea that we're flawed entirely and we're a problem. And that we need to uh, change round. We're curators. One of your big uh, campaigns at the moment is the 15-minute cities, these low-traffic neighbourhoods. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, well, you know, if <laughs> in the idea of a 15-minute neighbourhood, if you have all these great provisions and services around you, in principle, is a nice idea. If it's not mandatory that you have to do things within it, and if that's, you know, local authorities, their role has been historically to provide services. Now, we all know that even if you have got a GP near you, it's very, very difficult to get to see them quite a lot. But many of these places that are being discussed for the 15-minute neighbourhood cities, 20-minute cities, don't have things near them. So in East Oxford, for instance, where you've got a discussion about 20-minute or 15-minute neighbourhoods, uh, they don't have lots of facilities and often in poorer socioeconomic groups uh, they are not they do not have facilities close to them but the other thing is this uh, this is part of the active travel idea this livable streets that's been really funded in the last couple of years enormously so from central government but also local authorities making enormous money from some of the measures, so low traffic neighbourhoods, which is one part of an outlook where they've closed down roads and then they're charging people, as well as um, various uh, areas where they're just putting cameras into places. Uh, and then in addition to that, all sorts of restrictions on car movements or parking. And the, low, and, and the 15 minute neighbourhoods, what's happened is that when there's been any consultations, uh, the consultations are very loaded. When they do go out, they don't go out to everyone. And when they do go out to the few they do go out to with loaded questions and people don't like them and answer that back, then they're ignored. So the big problem with this whole discussion is a deficit of democracy. It's a lack of accountability. It's not listening to residents. If It's a bit like the conversation before. Let's have a cost-benefit analysis. Let's have the elected representative say, look, this is our plan. This is what we want to do. These are what they think the benefits are. These are the costs. And discuss it all and have it all out with everyone. And if everybody decides that that's what they want to do, then that's how democracy works. That's not what's happening with this discussion of 15 and 20 minute neighbourhoods. Uh, and it's very problematic uh, because of that. How widespread is it? I know it's happening in Oxford, but there's other places as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you look at uh, areas where... Uh, these ideas are percolating, you know, if you look at Bath and the whole ring of steel and the discussion and the fact that there's been very little proper consultation and people are not prepared, councillors and others are not prepared to come out and debate. If you look at the discussion in Canterbury, even the previous planners have said, this is a Stasi-like imposition, it's unnecessary, why do we need it? If you look at, um, there's a range of places, I mean, where it, it's, it's uh, taking the form that when people have... It's in some places it's only being presented now. Right. So uh, it's it's uh, if you look at Glasgow and Edinburgh and other areas, they're saying that we're going to begin to implement these things, but it's never with proper consultation, and 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 that is the issue that we're very concerned about. Alongside a lot of the ways, some of the other measures that are kind of linked but separate. So the bus gates and uh, you know, low traffic neighbourhoods and control zones. Uh, where allegedly they're separate and they're all trials often, 
But actually, each one is based on the other, and it's based on a kind of drive towards saying, we know what's best. This is going to happen, like Duncan Enright said at Oxford. It's going to happen regardless, or Mike Hakata in Harringay said, we're going to make it as painful as possible, because they know best, uh, and they want to implement these things. A bit like Philip Glanville, the mayor of Hackney, who said, you know, we're 75% of road closures we're going to have, because they know best, and they ignore the consultations, uh, and then they say that doing something on their website, uh, where a, a thousand people or so respond, that somehow represents uh, the people of the borough. It's really, really unacceptable. Where do these ideas like the 15 minute city come from? Well, the 15 minute. So, what happened quite some time ago is Ken Livingstone, uh, if you want to look at the provenance of these ideas, said, I'd like to get rid of all cars if I could. And Ken Livingstone was very involved in creating and working with uh, C40 cities, which is with a range of mayors around the world, which then led to an international summit. And Mike Bloomberg, the former mayor of New York, got very involved. And then those ideas about reducing traffic, uh, stopping some of these measures became much more stronger. Then Carlos Marino was basically uh, promoted this idea. And in Paris, we saw it being implemented. And it was around the time of lockdowns, it's became very very popular. So even though Wolverstow had done one in 2014 where you had this kind of uh, low traffic neighbourhood, the idea of the 15 minute city linked to some of these roadblocks and, and planning in this way became very popular then. And, uh, you know, it's backed by some pretty serious people internationally now. So you've got C40 cities, Bloomberg, and Bill Gates and others are all supporting these ideas. But actually they were homegrown ideas that had a bit of a contempt for cars for what cars represent for mobility we have to remember that it, cars really were synonymous with freedom and independence for many people not just in america but across the uk the idea that ordinary people could make decisions could do things and take their family to different places they could organize their schedule they could go, travel big areas uh, as well as small and especially uh, now we've got a situation where a whole range, very diverse mix of people are all very, very concerned about the limits and the impacts. Because it's not just if you're disabled or if you've got an elderly relative that you have to help and see, but it's people that have to do two or three kids at different school drops. Mm -hmm. What do you do if you've got to get shopping in different places as well during the day and it's raining or bad weather? Uh, it's seeing family and friends, it's having deliveries brought to you. But uh, you know, it's getting a cab late at night if you have to for safety. But actually, why should we have to explain what it's for? Um, you know, we've got this idea and it, it's that, that, that somehow, you know, we've got to limit everything. And it's really low horizons. It's based on this kind of idea that we're just killing and destroying everything. Many of the assumptions are flawed. Sadiq Khan, when he's talking about some of his measures, he uh, always uses this term 4,000 people because he can't um, uh, admit that, uh, well, he's been undemocratic because he's ignored over 5,000 responses to you, Les. He can't, he won't, you know, he's obviously been caught out. He bought the cameras, the NPR cameras for the ULES system before the consultation, contempt for democracy. And he's citing 4,000 uh, potential deaths. He's saying them as though they exist. But actually, even the research that was done uh, says not to do that. So he's basically... Uh, you know, these, all these measures that are kind of presented and argued with us as though um, we're the problem, we have to shut down cars. If you look at Oxford, um, you know, cars represent about 4 to 5% of any fumes. And it's, it's buses that represent up to 70% in some areas. So, you know, this whole thing needs to be unpacked and, and, and it should be done democratically. And that's why we have concerns about the way it's going. Uh, you know, obviously some places like Manhattan have places where you can have things in 15 minutes. But what people always forget in that conversation about Manhattan is the raging debates between Robert Moses and Jane Jacobs and the fact that they have big highways in Manhattan as well. And cars exist. They haven't just banned cars, right? So people, you know, don't take note of those things. I saw this um, story recently that residents of Plymouth woke up one morning and a hundred odd trees had been removed from the town centre and it was done in the dead of night. 
Um, do you think things are being done somewhat stealthily with a lot of these issues? Yeah, I mean, that was weird. I mean, there is the thing now that obviously we've got social media, so we get to see a lot more of things that happen. So you might have a small council meeting or something happen, like in Plymouth or a council meeting like you had in uh, Norfolk or in Glastonbury, and people show up and they film it, and then it, it goes viral. A lot of people get to see it. So things have been done in the past, but there is a deficit of democracy now. There's a situation where there's a reluctance to engage properly. And that hasn't just happened because of the lockdown. That's been a trend that's been happening for the last uh, couple of decades, where elected representatives nationally and locally have not been uh, held, not been um, responsible to their constituents, have kind of been come sort of divorced from being accountable to the public. M much of the public has retreated. They're often quite cynical and they think, you know, well, they're all the same. And that's something that we're really concerned about and that together we really want to redress and, and be change that. So the people who support these kind of measures, the 15-minute cities, etc., would say they're doing it in the name of improving safety and to save the planet. How would you respond to that? Yeah, I'm, when people use the word safety, I'm always concerned. Those like red alarm bells go off because um, we're keeping you safe um, is we've come to see could mean all sorts of things. Uh, as we've all seen the pictures of police forces in different countries uh, battening and strangling and suffocating and beating citizens to keep us safe. Uh, when we can see that none of that certainly should ever have happened, but it wasn't necessary in any way. And so I, my alarm bells go off about that. We see that people are being banned from speaking at universities in Britain. Even just today we're seeing that in the news uh, because we need to keep people safe. And actually it's really uh, dangerous, the idea that things are done with a kind of veneer of safety uh, that are done to us that limit and restrict and impact us. Now, uh, obviously... Um, you know, we'd all want to work out what would be the best way to deal with things, right? So that they're not, not too impactful and damaging in, in ways, but also that we put ourselves at the heart of it. And that means, you know, when people want to talk about what it means for people and everything, you know, the best way to ensure things are done sensibly is to have really good, decent living standards for people, to have better housing, better transport connections, employment, better wages, productivity and growth. That's where our emphasis should be on. That's how we can create the conditions to benefit as many people as possible and also to have uh, some wealth and, and provision to think about how we can innovate further and develop further uh, and harness different forms of energy uh, and use them in sensible ways. I mean, that's the trajectory that we should be on. You mentioned before the uh, ULAS expansion. Could you give us some background about what's happening with that? Well, uh, so the mayor has said that in August the ULAS expansion is going to happen, although there's, there's, there's now noises saying he may postpone that. He's under enormous pressure, and it should be clear that many people do not want this to happen. Obviously, many councils around London... Uh, do not want it and said that they've challenged it. He's got Labour MPs uh, that have challenged him on this. It will always impact the poorest again. There's lots of people that will impact detrimentally. Uh, and also, um, you know, he's indicated that it would be better if people were connected electronically to cars and others so you could get immediate uh, deductions. We've seen in Birmingham that up to 70,000 people have not paid the clean air zone, similar to ULES charge there. They've contested and challenged that and they're not being collected. Uh, it, the, I think the thing is that Sadiq Khan has really overplayed this. He, it's, it's unnecessary. He's trying to use it as a cash cow and a grab. He's um, repeating platitudes. He's now talking about deniers today. Um, you know, a terrible term, actually. Like he's calling people like environmental deniers, but um, it's a taken from the from the Holocaust, right? I mean, Holocaust obviously happened. Uh, and then, you know, so to people say it didn't happen, I said deny. But then you try and s smear people with this term who are genuinely concerned about cost of living, impacts of it, the n need for it, and the lack of the democratic engagement of people. So Sadiq Khan's not going to get off the hook with this. Um, many are challenging it. There's regular protests in Trafalgar Square. There's a big one coming up. Together's involved with working with lots of people on the ground in London and surrounding areas around London um, and, and people are going to keep fighting it and actually 
I really generally think it's going to have to go. There were consultations on, on this ULAS and the majority of people didn't want it and the London boroughs around that didn't want it and the surrounding counties didn't want it. How can the London authorities justify moving ahead with that kind of opposition? Yeah, well, it's, it's a very good question and um, it's where partisanship sort of gets stuck in and people get locked into their, I'm going to do it anyway. But I think Sadiq Khan, well, it's clear that road charging is become, is an outlook, is an idea. So everywhere we go, we get charged for road use in different areas, cameras everywhere. He bought the cameras before the consultation. As you say, he's ignored uh, respondents in the so-called consultation and he's ignoring so-called partners in lots of different boroughs uh, inside London and outside London where lots of people are going to be affected and damaged. This impacts so many people. Um, I think that, um, you know, the, the noise is going to get louder, the challenges are going to get more and also Mark Harper uh, and others, you know, at the Department for Transport and the government, they could step in because although he has jurisdiction for travel... Uh, like with Scotland, there are measures where these things are damaging, where the government can step in. Uh, you know, it needs to go. It's overwhelming, cl cl overwhelmingly clear that a majority of people do not want this. Uh, and, you know, he should take heed of that. You mentioned the cameras. So there's been another 3,000 cameras being installed as, as part of this expansion. Um, and they're already talking about sharing the data from the cameras with the Met. Mm. Should people be more concerned about this kind of issue? London's already one of the most surveilled cities in the world. It is. I mean, London, yeah, I think proportionally, uh, it's in the top three at least mm. uh, uh, of the most surveilled cities. And, uh, you know, the ongoing discussion about digital ID, about central bank digital currency, uh, about movement, mobility you, you don't take a genius to, to see that you've got various boroughs saying up to 75 percent of roads are going to be closed and then you've got cameras everywhere and then you've got other cities and towns saying we're going to have these cycle only and walk only or only a certain amount of travels per year for cars and charges and by the way we can do it all digitally oh isn't this convenient and all of a sudden we've got a situation like that and you know we're being told that we get emergency uh, messages through our phones and they might get locked and we've seen what's happened in the last few years where things like uh, PayPal and, and Eventbrite and others have taken people down and in fact with GoFundMe and the Canadian truckers and Trudeau that people have had their accounts frozen. These are in countries that we would never have expected them to happen. They're happening in, in Britain and in America and Canada and elsewhere um, and so I think that um, we should be very concerned all round about surveillance, about privacy, about our rights to privacy, about and and together uh, we've been insisting that um, you know that's a key uh, one of our principles that we do not have further surveillance. We have no mandatory ID. Uh, we were actually born out of the challenge to vaccine passports when when um, Boris Johnson said, "Oh, but it's Freedom Day, and by the way, you're going to have vaccine passports." No digital ID that's that's mandatory, not to participate in life. And that our privacy and choice and autonomy is really fundamental. And that's why we need everyone together, we encourage them to champion that and to campaign and lobby around those things in each area of our work. How close is this digital ID to becoming um, an, an actual thing that's implemented? Uh, well, I, I think that partly it depends on the consultation and everything, but... You know, the thing about digital ID is that there can be some instances where digital ID, can, if it's ring-fenced, can be useful. So if there's, like, medical records that you're getting and it's just with the doctor and all of that, the, where the issue becomes much more problematic is its relationship with the state and its use for uh, surveying citizens and that type of thing. And so uh, I think a lot of it depends on what we do. Uh, and, and how much people get involved and uh, getting our voices heard together and getting made. That's why we're really clear that we want to have people, you know, constantly putting pressure on their local councillors and MPs and on government. We should remember that we local councillors only get voted in by a few hundred people. You know, often 
the turnout is less than 20% of, of the constituents. If we begin to make sure that we have our voices heard much more, put pressure on people, and many people are beginning to stand independently now, a lot of people are politically homeless, but that shouldn't turn to cynicism. We are able to steer the direction of things, and we, we really do ourselves damage if we just think, oh, we just give up on it, there's nothing we can do. It's really important that we can uh, have an impact and shape the direction that we want things to go in. One of the threads that unites these issues that uh, Together focuses on is the fight against global warming. Do you feel that global warming has taken over from the lockdowns as a way of reducing people's freedoms, possibly even taxing people a bit more? I think there's a real impulse to restrict uh, and limit. Now, we know that discussions like limits to growth, um, sustainable uh, development. It's a bit of an oxymoron, right? You either have development or sustainability. You know, the limits to growth, the restrictions, that's a particular outlook. When we've seen with lockdowns, like impositions and restrictions, there's a real sense by some that they would like to just, just do it, just lock, just restrict, just impose. And an idea that they don't really need to convince. It's too, we haven't got time, the virtues and the arguments. It's, it's an emergency. Everyone, right, we must do this. And that is the issue. And I think that uh, anything that we dis dis discuss or decide to do, we need to kind of rationally, coolly and calmly discuss it. We need to think about how it's best for everyone, what we should do and why, and not be cajoled or nudged or, or sh smeared or whatever it is. But it needs to be done on the basis of a democratic free society where we engage and we win hearts and minds, we make the case for those things. Uh, and look at the consequences and the implications. And I think we need to be much more oriented towards um, being able to develop things, to create, to make wealth creation for all. So everyone makes more money, right? You know, um, you know. There's often a dichotomy. You know, to, should should the union, should the workers make more money, or should companies have it? Or uh, there's an opportunity for us all to make much more, to have robust and dynamic wealth creation. It means so zombie companies need to fail. We can't keep propping them up, but we should have retraining. And there's a reason why we're launching a together cabinet where we have we're going to have spokespeople in each area in the economy and health education um democracy because uh these issues are really important and how we handle them and you know you can't retreat from the idea that you need to develop things and you need to invest and you need to have r d and you, you know we've stepped away from so many of these things and there's the potential to really uh, have a kind of great exhibition it's almost like you know a festival of britain and what that could look like and inspire the rest of the world where we can harness so much of our resources and from from the sea and waves to nuclear and uh really create a new renaissance of ideas and development and society and i think the impulse to limit and restrict and nudge and smear and censor are something we should uh make sure that we don't allow to happen and that we sing a much better song which is future oriented which is based on our capabilities uh, and creating a dynamic society that everyone can uh, transform the world that we live in and create many more opportunities together so if people watching this feel they want to bring about some positive change what would you encourage them to do I'd encourage them all to come uh, to togetherdeclaration.org to join us as a member. You know, when people join as a member at Together, uh, it helps us carry on campaigning. It grows our network. If you'd like to get involved to become a local regional uh, ambassador, create a little hub around your area, get involved. We That's really important. We, we're doing that uh, all over. And to get more active and involved and, and have your say and make sure your voice is heard. Shouting at the TV is not helpful it can be something that can inspire you to begin with but if we get involved with our fellow citizens and, and people you know friends family colleagues let's get us all involved let's have our voice at the table let's make sure we're heard uh, that's the way that we can shape things and if we can get people involved together that would be great Alan Miller thank you for joining us on British Thought Leaders thank you for having me